Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you because of your mighty hand upon our lives this new year. I thank you for my brothers and sisters who have been responding so well in this, our new series of studies. Thank you for the insight you have been giving to us. Thank you because of the instructions we have been receiving and because of the involvement we have in these studies that definitely will lead us to a lot of profitable spiritual things in our lives. Father, we thank you because of the way you are opening our eyes to behold wonderful things in your word. Father, we pray that we will touch our very lives, touch our very hearts, and touch our response to the call of God in our lives in Jesus' name. Oh Lord, we pray that as we go through these pages of scripture, that the very voice of the Spirit of God will sound clearly in our heart, clearly in our ears, so that we'll be able to arise and do the will of God in this our own generation in Jesus' name. Lord, we know that what lies ahead of us today in the study is rich, is enduring, and is very deep. Therefore, Lord, we are praying that you will open the eyes of every one of us, mm -hmm. that we will be able to see everything you want us to see, mm -hmm. and make us the people we ought to be. Mm -hmm. Touch our lives with your power, that will never be the same again, and that we will go ahead and do what you want us to do, to the glory of your name, mm -hmm. and that what we do will have your backing, your support, and your blessing, so that our lives with our ministries will be of tremendous benefit, to thousands of people around us. Amen. Use us, Lord, to your own glory. Amen. In Jesus' mighty name, we pray. Amen. I welcome you once again to our study of Exodus. It's been a wonderful time as we've gone through chapters 1, 2, and 3. Today we come to chapter 4. And this chapter is very, very important for every one of us. In our last study, we learned of the purpose and plan of God to send Moses to deliver God's suffering people. Can we just pause a moment and think about that? In this world, God has a lot of suffering people. They are suffering because they do not know the truth. They have not known Jesus Christ. They are suffering because of the consequences of sin. And we need to know that God is having compassion upon them. As he remembers that his only begotten son has died for them, he wants to send his message unto them. His message of love, his message of grace, his message of power. And he wants people, his own servants, that will be faithful unto him, that he will send forth. And so God at this time sent Moses that he will deliver God's sovereign, sovereign people. Instead of responding with gratitude, that God had chosen to use him, though unworthy, Moses questioned and said, Who am I? That I should go unto Pharaoh. In response to this, God assured him that he will be with him. Today's study brings us further to the objections that Moses raised. He continued to object to the call because, one, the people's unbelief stared him in the face. He thought, they will not believe me. How many times we have thought, if I stood up in the bus to preach, they will not believe me. If I tell my neighbors about Christ, they will not believe me. If I will testify to my parents, they will not believe me. If I testify to my schoolmates and to my colleagues in the place of work, they will not believe me. We conclude everybody in unbelief before we even meet them. And so Moses did. He had lost contact with the people for about 40 years. And now he said, the people will not believe. Not only that, there was a second reason. His own slowness of speech. He began to look at his inability. Inadequacies. Isn't that exactly what we do? First of all, we complain about the people. That they are not going to believe. They are not going to accept. Then we look at ourselves and we say, in any case, even if they are going to believe, I don't think I can present the message convincingly. For them to believe, because we look at our inability, we look at our inadequacies, we look at the lack of talent or the lack of gift in us. And obviously, number three, he looked at the inability to do such a great task. 
when it thought about Pharaoh, it thought about Egypt, it thought about all those ta taskmasters, and it thought of going to confront them. He obviously thought it was a greater task than he could perform. Maybe the Lord is calling you to a task that you feel is greater than your strength, greater than your experience, greater than your ability, greater than your knowledge. Don't you remember that the Lord is not calling you because of who you are. He's calling you because of who he is. Never forget that. And if you don't forget that, you will not complain about the people some believe, about your lack of talent and gift, about your inability or inefficiency or inadequacies. And you will not complain about the greatness of the task that is ahead of you. God then, in his love and mercy, God then, in his compassion and condescension, endowed him with supernatural power and granted him the assistance of his brother Aaron, who was eloquent. And then God promised to be with his mouth and to use him to deliver the children of Israel. So that brings us to what we're going to study today. We're going to study chapter 4. And we have 31 verses. Well, we'll study some of the verses in depth. And some of the verses that just add to the story to make the story very clear to us. We'll read and just pass through. As I believe, you are very prayerful. I believe also that the Spirit of God will take these things much more than what I can say. Much more than the things I can point out. That the Spirit of God himself will open your heart, will open your ears, will open your eyes, and it will make you to behold and to learn wonderful wondrous things out of his word we come to this chapter as we look at god's power in god's servant that's the title god's power and god's servant we must link those two things together and as you look at the practice of god you see that those two things always come together on the one hand the servant of god on the other hand the supernatural power of god because let's face it God's work cannot be done with human strength, human ability, human knowledge, human understanding. When God actually calls a man or a woman, because he does call both men and women, when God calls a man or a woman to a particular task, that task is so much above us. That task is so much greater than our own strength that it, that it will take more than human strength, human ability to do it. That's why God will match the supernatural with the servant. He will channel his supernatural power through his appointed servant. So today we're going to study God's power in his servant. There are three points we're going to note in the study. Number one, supernatural signs accompany divine call. Supernatural signs accompany divine call. Number two. Moses' complaint and God's condescension. Number three, obedience and return of Moses to Egypt. Let's go back to point one. Supernatural signs accompany divine call. We're reading together from Exodus chapter four. Please open your Bible from verse one. And Moses answered and said, But behold, they will not believe me and nor hearken unto my voice. For they will say, The Lord has not appeared unto thee. And the Lord said unto him, What is that in thine hand? And he said, A rod. And he said, Cast it on the ground. And he cast it on the ground, and it became a serpent. And Moses fled from before it. And the Lord said unto Moses, Put forth thine hand, and take it by the tail. And he put forth his hand, and cut it, and it became a rod in his hand, that they may believe that the Lord God of their fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob, and has, has appeared unto thee. And the Lord said furthermore unto him, Put now thine hand into thy bosom. And he put his hand into his bosom. And when he took it out, behold, his hand was leprous as snow. And he said, Put thine hand into thy bosom again. And he put his hand into his bosom again, and plucked it out of his bosom. 
and behold it was turned again as the other flesh and it shall come to pass if they will not believe thee neither hearken to the voice of the first sign that they will believe the voice of the latter sign and it shall come to pass if they will not believe also these two signs neither hearken unto thy voice that thou shalt take of the water of the river and pour it upon the dry land and the water which thou takest out of the river shall become blood upon the dry land let's stop there for a moment for our first point remember our first point is supernatural signs that accompany divine call the lord had called moses no doubt if you go back to chapter 3 verse 10 we read come now therefore and i will send thee unto pharaoh that thou mayest bring forth my people the children of israel out of egypt here god declared the call god was calling him come now and i will send thee then god told him the mission i'm sending you unto pharaoh god told him the ministry you will deliver them from the land of egypt and god told him the outcome of the mission and the ministry that will bring forth my people and they will worship the lord as verse 12 now they will worship me upon this mountain and so god had called moses but then moses had a complaint look at it in chapter 4 verse 1 and moses answered and said but behold they will not believe me nor hearken unto my voice for they will say the lord has not appeared unto thee now what moses was saying is this he said if i go to the children of israel and i told them that the lord has sent me unto you to deliver you they're going to say he said in in verse in chapter 3 he said they will ask me what is the name of that god that's in chapter 3 verse 13 moses said unto god behold when i come unto the children of israel and shall say unto them the god of your fathers has sent me unto you they shall say to me what is his name what shall i say unto them god had given answer to that question but it was what i'll call a theological question as well as a theological answer you see theology is about god what is his name what is his character what do you know about him that's talking about the knowledge and then god said you tell them i am that i am and i told you last week that i am that i am actually contains three tenses of the verb to be it means i was i am and i will always be this means that god was introducing himself as a self-existent one as a changeless one as the one that is the same from everlasting to everlasting and the one that says i am god i change not is the mighty god the powerful god the omnipotent one and the one that has enough power to change every situation and to bring them out of the land of egypt because he says i'm god i change not i created the world and i can recreate whatever needs to be recreated he can use his power to, to deliver them then moses said that's all right it's a good point of theology but then he had another question now what will be the evidence they're going to ask me for the evidence where is the evidence you have met god and so that's why he said they will not believe me and in the verses that followed that's in chapter 4 now that god told him to perform all these miracles that will be the evidence and that is the way god always works he reveals himself unto us he teaches us about himself so we are very clear about the message we are going to deliver about God. But then he gives the signs, the wonders, the supernatural, the miracles to be able to attest to the call. To be able to attest to the message. To be able to confirm the message he has given unto us. Let's now follow through. As we look at the reason for the signs and the wonders. Remember that Moses was very human. His faith appeared weak notwithstanding the gracious assurances that god had given him 
Moses continued to raise objection, which I just read to you. He said, Behold, they will not believe me, nor hearken to my voice. They will say, The Lord has not appeared unto thee. He was saying, They will say they need an evidence. In response, God endued Moses with power to do miracles and to manifest the supernatural. The manifestation of God's supernatural power through Moses was an evidence that God indeed had appointed him, had called him, had sent him to deliver the children of Israel from Egypt. Already we're ready together. You'll see that there was a rod in his hand, just a common rod. The rod in his hand was made the subject of a miracle, in fact, of a double miracle. Throw it down. And without Moses suspecting or thinking or imagining what will become of that rod if he threw it down miraculously, instantaneously, it became a serpent. It fled from it. And then God said, hold it by the tail. Thank God he obeyed the Lord. Now, I'll be talking about this miracle later. You see, these are the first signs and wonders recorded in scripture. And I need to tell you this. If you are going to really be used of God in signs and wonders, you'll need to hear clearly from God and you'll need to obey God without fear and promptly. Because you see, if you are going to open the eyes of the blind, there will be the first blind eyes that you are going to deal with. And whenever you have never dealt with anything, you see the fear is that what if this happens? What if that does not happen? And Moses had never done this before. And God said, put forth your hand. He put forth his hand and he took it by the tail. Because God had said, take it by the tail, not by the body, not by the head. You see, those who are going to be used in the miracle ministry, they are people who are sensitive to the voice of God. They are people who are sensitive to the leading of the Lord. They know what to do, at what time, and how to do it. And so when Moses did that, he became a rod. So then that's why I said that trot became the subject of a double miracle. But then he needed another miracle. Why? Out of the mouths of two or three witnesses, the truth shall be established. In fact, when God was speaking, do you know what God said? God attributed, listen to this, a voice to the miracles. Look at verse 8. And it shall come to pass, if they will not believe thee, neither hearken to the voice of the first sign, the voice of the first sign that they will believe the voice of the latter sign the second sign is saying that these miracles will have a way of speaking to the people these miracles will give testimony to the people it will speak with a quiet silent voice convincing them in their heart the meaning is this when they see those miracles there's going to be the still small voice quiet but clear in their heart saying these signs show very clearly that this man moses had met with god and so the second sign was this i said why was the second sign given because out of the mouth of two or three witnesses the truth shall be established when you see the first sign and they will be wondering in their heart what's the purpose of all this has this man really seen god has god appeared unto him has god appointed him Will he be our deliverer? Then comes the second sign. And the second sign will confirm the first. And will say, yes, God appeared unto him. God appointed him. God called him. God is going to use him. The sign itself next became the subject of a miracle. Also a double miracle. Put it in your bosom, God said. And instantaneously, immediately, it became leprous. White as snow. And then God said, put it back again. Once again, understand, if God is going to use us in the miracle ministry, we need to be listening to God. You cannot just listen to God half of the way. You have to listen to God all the way through. Otherwise, you may just discover that you start in the spirit and you continue in the flesh. And you see that the miracle ministry cannot continue that way. For the miracle ministry to really be effective in our lives and be powerful in our lives, we start in the spirit, we continue in the spirit, we end in the spirit. And so he listened to the Lord again. And the Lord said, put, for, put in thy hand again into that same bosom. And when he brought it out, it became whole as the other. 
I'll be showing you the importance of these miracles as we go on. Then he was directed that on arrival in Egypt, when it became necessary, should the people not believe that he will turn water into blood. These are powerful miracles, creative miracles. There will be miracles that show that this man Moses had met with the God of creation. Had met with God who can change things and change people and change circumstances and change anything and everything at a twinkling in a twinkling of an eye. And that's still the same God we're serving today. But then let's answer this question. What was the purpose of the miracle? An important question. And what is the purpose of miracles today? important important question what was the purpose of that miracle i want you to single out the word in verse one the word believe moses answered and said but behold they will not believe me underline that word believe in your bible you see that was the very reason why god told this man to perform these miracles how do we know? Oh, because of what God himself said. Look at verse 5. That they may believe that the Lord God of their fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob has appeared unto thee, that they may believe. You see the purpose of that miracle? Not only that, I want you to go further into verse 8. And it shall come to pass, if they will not believe thee. You see that? The purpose is to convince them. The purpose is to make them believe it shall come to pass if they will not believe thee neither hearken to the voice of the first sign that they will believe the voice of the latter sign that they will believe believe that's the purpose that was the purpose of the miracles that god did through moses look at verse 9 and it shall come to pass if they will not believe thee also, if they will not believe also these two signs, neither hearken unto, the vo unto thy voice, that thou shalt take of the water of the river and pour it out upon the dry land, and the water shall, which thou shalt, which thou takest out of the river, shall become blood upon the dry land. What, for what purpose? That they will believe. So please let us notice to start with that the purpose of miracles, the purpose of signs and wonders, is not just to make us excited. It's not just to make us clap our hands. It's not just to make us laugh. It's not just to make us see that there is a man called Moses that can work wonders or perform miracles or that there is a coordinator or that there is a sonar leader or there is a prayer warrior that by the grace of God has been given power to do the supernatural or that there is a pastor that can pray and the sick will get healed. That's not the purpose. The purpose is that we will believe. Look at this same chapter, chapter 4 and verse 30. Chapter 4 of Exodus from verse 30 and verse 31. And Aaron spoke all the words which the Lord had spoken unto Moses and did the signs in the sight of the people. What was the result? Verse 31. And the people believed. You see that? That was the purpose. And you see, when God has equipped you, energized you, empowered you endowed you with signs and wonders make sure that you keep this purpose in mind it is not to exalt ourselves and it is not to exalt any man it is to lead the heart of people to believe on the lord verse 31 and the people believed and when they heard that the lord had visited the children of israel and had looked and that he had looked upon their affliction and they bowed their heads and worshipped. What's the purpose of the miracles? To make them believe so much they come to worship the Lord. And as God has been performing miracles in our midst, in our church, let us understand, to, let us remember to remind the people that the purpose why God has healed them, the purpose why God has delivered them, the purpose why God has provided for them, the purpose why God has manifested the supernatural, signs and wonders in our midst is so that the people will believe now we know of the lord jesus christ that he worked miracles signs and wonders now what was the purpose and what was the effect of these signs and wonders 
in the lives of the people that saw the miracles of Jesus Christ. What was the intention of Jesus in working those miracles? Let's now turn to John. Gospel according to St. John. Chapter 20, verses 30 and 31. And many other signs truly did Jesus in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book. Verse 31, but these are written, that she might believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing ye might have life through his name. The, these signs were written, the ones we have seen in the Bible, so that we'll be able to believe that Jesus is the very Son of God. That's why you'll find Matthew writing much about the miracles of Jesus Christ. Why? That the readers that he wrote that to, the Jewish people originally, and the people of the world today, will believe that Jesus is the Christ. That's why you find Mark from the very first chapter writing about the miracles. Why? That the people might believe. That's why you find Luke writing about the miracles over and over. In fact, from the first, uh, from Luke chapter 1, it begins to write the miracle of conception, the mystery of conception. Conception by the Holy Ghost. And then in verse 37, it says with God, all things are possible. And then to show that all things are possible with God, it then narrates miracles upon miracles upon miracles to the very final end of that book in the climactic miracle of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Why do we have all those miracles? That the people will believe that Jesus is the very Son of God. Let's look at John chapter 14 verses 10 and 11 john chapter 14 verses 10 and 11 believest thou that i am in the father and the father in me the words that i speak unto you i speak not of myself but the father that dwelleth in me he doeth the works verse 11 believe me that i am in the father and a father in me or else or else believe me for the very works sake telling us that the purpose of the works of jesus the wonders of jesus the miracles of jesus is that the people might believe in him the people should have believed when they saw those miracles in john chapter 10 john chapter 10 verse 25 jesus answered them I told you, and ye believe me, and ye believe not the works that I do in my Father's name, they bear witness of me. They bear witness that the Father has sent me. They bear witness that the Father is with me. They bear witness that I am the appointed Messiah. I am the anointed Christ. I am the Savior of the world. That's what Jesus said, that he was the Savior of the world, and the very works that he did should have convinced the people. Verse 38, But if I do, though ye believe me not, believe the works, that ye may know and believe that the Father is in me, and I in him. You can see very clearly then, brothers and sisters, the purpose of the miracles that Jesus did. And what's the purpose of the miracles today? Let's now look at Mark chapter 16. Because Jesus has now empowered his own servants. All his servants, if you are servants of God, working for the glory of God, wanting to bring people to the Lord, this miracle working power is available for you. Because we are told in Mark chapter 1 from verse 16. Let me read from verse 15. And he said unto them, Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. Well, they will need to believe. Verse 16. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. But he that believeth not shall be damned. What if people do not believe? What if people are not willing to listen to us? What if people are not convinced by what we say alone? Well, the supernatural signs and wonders, the miracles, are there to confirm the word, to make them believe. Verse 17. And these signs shall follow them that believe. In my name, they shall cast out devils. They shall speak with new tongues. They shall take up serpents. And if they drink any deadly thing, it shall not hurt them. They shall lay their hands on the sick. They shall lay hands on the sick. And they shall recover. 
What's the purpose for all that? Verse 20. And he went forth and preached everywhere. The Lord walking with them. The Lord walking with them. And confirming the word with signs following. Confirming the word. Saying, oh yes, I sent them. Oh yes, that is the true gospel, the saving message of the Lord. Oh yes, I'm backing them up. I'm supporting them. I called them. I pointed them. I anointed them. And with, with the miracles and the signs and wonders that followed, God confirmed that those people were his own servants. Now, as we go back to Exodus chapter 4, we now need to think of the miracles themselves. There are three miracles here that uh, Moses had been enabled, empowered, energized to perform when it will become necessary. Let's take them one by one and try to see the importance and the message that these miracles add for Moses and for us today because there are important lessons to learn from them. The first one is about the rod. The next one is about his hand. And the next one, the third one is about the water that he was able to turn into blood. Or he'll be able to turn into blood. The rod, a common, ordinary shepherd's staff, when surrendered to God, becomes a wonder through which God manifests his power. You realize that this rod was simply the shepherd's staff. As Moses was a shepherd, taking care of the sheep of Jethro, he had a rod in his hand. And this rod was just the ordinary thing that probably Moses had had in his hand for the past 40 years since he became a shepherd. And now when God wanted to perform a miracle, God now used the rod in his hand. It means simple things in your possession. Under the direct command of God can become the means of miracles, signs, and wonders. That's the lesson to learn. The simple things we have in the hand. That's the way God always works. Do you remember? The servants of the prophet had gone to the riverside. And they had borrowed an axe. And then the axe said, fell into the, into the river. And then they said, alas, my master, because we borrowed it. How is this iron rod, iron axe head going to come up again? Throw the stick, the one in your hand now, throw it into that same place. He threw it there and then they were told that the iron head did swim. Do you see how God can use what's in your hand to perform a miracle? Here was a woman that Elijah had been sent to. And all she had at home was just a little meal that she will cook for herself and her son and they will die. And then God sent Elijah there. I have commanded the widow woman there to feed thee what she had in hand. And then Elijah said, prepare for me. Do as you have said, but prepare for me first. And the miracle continued every day. Do you see that? What was in their hand? What was available was what God used in performing the miracle. Here came a widow unto Elisha and said that I am a widow, the wife of a prophet, but the prophet had died. But we owe so much money. And we have nothing to pay. And the creditors have come wanting to take my son. Because of the money we cannot pay. And then Elisha said, what do you have at home? Oh, he said, just what I have is oil. He said, go and borrow empty vessels, not a few. Lock up your door and begin to pour. And then she began to pour. And all those vessels were filled. And then he came to, she came to Elisha and said, look at all the things that are filled. He said, go and sell and pay your debt. Do you see that miracle? What she had in hand was what God used in performing the miracle. You come on to the New Testament. And there were thousands of people, more than 5,000. Counting the men alone, we have 5,000 men. What are they going to eat? How are they going to be provided for? In fact, they said 200 penny worth a loaf of bread will not be able to feed these people. But they said, all we have here, five loaves and two fishes. Then they commented, what is this among the multitude? And then Jesus said, bring them. Why don't you bring what you have to the Lord? Because it is what you have in your hand that God will use to perform a miracle. And they brought it and then he multiplied it. That's the point we're making. It was a simple rod in the hand of Moses. And then God said, throw it down. And it became a serpent. Take it up again by the tail. And then it became a rod again. And that was one of the supernatural things. That he will take back unto, uh, unto 
uh, Egypt. And then it will become the means of miracle working power of God in his hand. Learn your lesson. When a man is truly called of God, his ordinary talent, like a mere rod, can be used supernaturally by God. The little grammar you know, do you know that that's sufficient in the hands of God? Miraculously can begin to save people. The little verses of scripture that you know, at least you know John 3, 16. At least you know uh, Matthew chapter 1, verse 21. At least you know that Jesus Christ is the savior of the world. That little thing that do, you think it doesn't matter, just a simple sentence, speak it out. Throw it down. Give it to the people. It is that little message you have. It is that little understanding you have. It is that short verse you have that God is going to use to perform the wonder of wonders, the salvation of souls. My brothers and sisters, let us understand that you may not have a great talent. You wouldn't tell me that the rod was a great thing, a mighty thing, through which God can work a miracle. But then the little gift you have, the little talent you have, the little experience you have, surrender it into the hands of the Lord and God can use it to work mighty, mighty miracles. But I still see another thing to learn from this. The miracle should also have convinced Moses that he will be able to deal with the old serpent notice this at the command of god at the command of god when this rod had become a serpent then the lord said stretch forth your hand handle it by the tail as moses was going back onto uh, egypt he will see the activities of the old serpent because all those things that pharaoh did all that the magicians did all that the taskmasters did actually they were the activities of a quiet silent but a wicked uh, snake a wicked serpent the devil walking behind them and god was telling him as you have handled the snake at my command you'll be able to handle the old serpent at my command and isn't that the command were given from the lord because he says this sign shall follow them that believe he said in my name you will cast out devils in my name you will lay hands on the sick they shall recover in my name he said you will take up serpents like moses took up the serpent here and you'll be able to make the works and the activities of that old serpent to become nothing being commissioned by god he was also empowered by god but then there was a second sign the sign of the leprous hand obviously he taught moses and he taught others and he should be teaching us the marvelous power of the great god who sent moses instantaneously leprosy came on the hand instantaneously immediately the leprosy was also cured listen to this without the use of natural means or medical things or any kind of medication an astounding miracle and wonder this signified to moses that by the power of God, he'll be able to bring terrible diseases upon Egypt just at the snap of the finger at the word of command. Isn't that what happened? When Moses got back to Egypt, he saw that he could bring hail upon them, he could bring uh, the lice upon them, he could bring frogs upon them, he could bring darkness into the land, he could bring the sword displeasure and the judgment and even diseases upon Egypt at just a simple word of command. It was telling Moses how simple it will be that those miraculous supernatural things will be done. Not only that, in putting the hand back, and the hand was cured immediately it signified to moses that when those diseases will come upon egypt that moses will be able to act as a mediator as, a, as an intercessor as a person that will be able to pray and just at a single word talking to god god will be able to take the diseases away instantaneously not only that the leprosy being the symbol of sin and defilement in egypt can be instantaneously removed today by the power of God through Christ the mediator because Christ is the one that is greater than Moses and if all that could be removed instantaneously by the power of God then we know that even today if there's defilement of sin in your own life it can be removed also by the supernatural power of God do you feel dirty and defiled within do you feel as if your soul is leprous as if your soul your spirit your mind is defiled well instantaneously you can go to god he will remove the pollutions of sin 
it will remove the defilement of sin it will cleanse you instantaneously that's how we know that salvation is instantaneous by the instantaneous manifestation of the power of god and the cleansing of the blood of jesus all the leprosy of sin the defilement of sin the corruption the pollutions of sin can be re can be removed instantaneously immediately the moment you trust in christ the lord and savior not only that we see that there was going to be a third sign because he was told that if the testimony of the two of the first two signs was refused then the third will come we learn a lesson from that that this third miracle tells us of the consequence of unbelief the consequence of refusing to believe the first two testimonies now this is what we learn that there are some miracles that are to make us believe there are other miracles that are to bring judgment as a result of not believing what we should have believed and so if man rejects the testimony of god's word and refuses the one who alone can deliver nothing but divine judgment will be awaiting such an individual you know blood is a sign of wonder of uh, of war and judgment blood is a sign of war and judgment and it assured moses of retribution punishment upon the wickedness of the egyptians that water will be turned into blood that is instead of life that water brings you see when we drink water we are refreshed our dreary or dry life becomes refreshed but instead of water there will be blood which means life will give way will give place to death which is the judgment of god so then we have learned today that god spoke unto moses and he confirmed the speech with the supernatural before i pass on to the second point let me just remind you that that ordinary rod the rod of moses became eventually the rod of god look at chapter 4 verse 17 and thou shalt take this rod in thine hand wherewith thou shalt do signs my question to you again is what's that in your hand that one talent god has given you don't grumble don't say i need five talents no you don't need five talents one rod is enough one talent is enough and you can take that talent in your hand take that gift god has given you that little gift little in your own estimation just a mere rod a shepherd's staff and just that single gift or single talent you can take and the lord will do mighty things even through you then in verse 20 the rod had become the rod of god moses took his wife and his sons and set them upon an ass and he returned to the land of egypt and moses took the rod of god in his hand originally it was the rod of moses but then it eventually became the rod of god why don't you surrender what you have unto the lord and don't say it is mine anymore don't say my talent my gift my ability my rod what i can do why don't you surrender it to god and then when it becomes god's property to serve god to work for god to declare the glory of god and to use for the propagation of the kingdom of god alone it becomes the rod of god and there is no limit to what that little talent can do in your life now we go to point two moses complaint and god's condescension moses complaint and god's condescension let's look now at exodus chapter 4 and we're reading from verse 10 and moses said unto the lord oh my lord i am not eloquent neither heretofore nor since thou hast spoken unto thy servant but i am slow of speech and of a slow tongue and the lord said unto him who has made man's mouth and who maketh the dumb or deaf or the seen or the blind have not i the lord now therefore go and i will be with thy mouth and teach thee what thou shalt say and he said "O oh, my lord send i pray thee by the hand of him whom thou wilt send then and the anger of the lord was kindled against moses and he said is not aaron the levite thy brother i know that he can speak well 
and also behold he cometh forth to meet thee and when he seeth thee he'll be glad in his heart and thou shalt speak unto him and put words in his mouth and i will be with thy mouth and with his mouth i will teach you what ye shall do and he shall be thy spokesman unto the people and he shall be even he shall be to thee instead of a mouth and thou shalt be to him instead of god and thou shalt take this rod in thine hand wherewith thou shalt do signs here we see the complaint of moses moses had every reason after these signs were given to him to accept god's assignment and to believe his word but his unwillingness was still present and a further excuse was offered he said he was low of speech he was of a slow tongue moses supposed as many do today that the gift of eloquent speech is a prime prerequisite for effective ministry you know what moses was thinking about moses was thinking god can never use a stammerer how many of us think like that how many of us talk like that how many of us when we interview people when we check up the call of god if we see any difficulty at all in the way the individual is speaking then we conclude the lord had not called him i hope you change that attitude today in fact do you know god was angry with moses because of that thing that he said and because of what he was holding on to you see god said i'll be with you god's presence will be with you god said you can walk these signs he said god's power will be with you but then moses said the presence of god and the power of god are not sufficient because i cannot speak well and god was angry with him because he refused to believe that the way he was god had made him and god knew what he was doing and god knew what he was going to use him for even though he had difficulty and he was slow of speech let us correct that impression that if we're going to do anything for god that we have to be people who are eloquent and people who are orators and you see this is the same mistake that is made in many christian schools and colleges they always must have a course in rhetoric and elocution that means they major in training people on how to present their messages with excellency of speech and of great wisdom and such so trained people will often produce preaching with enticing words of man's wisdom but they lack something they always lack something they lack the demonstration of the spirit and of power all the schooling in the world is of no avail whatever unless the lord is with thy mouth unless the lord is with the mouth of the minister teaching him what to say you know as you think about how god has worked in marvelous ways it is likely that anywhere in the world anywhere in the world you mention the pilgrim's progress written by john boyan it is likely that any christian most christians in the world will know about that book do you understand that john boyan who wrote the pilgrim's progress he was not a seminary graduate he was not a university fellow he was just an ordinary individual and god has used that simple language of the unlettered john boyan far more than he has used the polished writing of thousands of seminary graduates let us take courage and let us be encouraged by what god has done after all even the disciples of jesus christ and those first apostles we are told that when they saw their boldness they took knowledge of them they had been with jesus and they knew that they had never learned it is not what the schools make us what the colleges make us what the universities make us it is what the spirit and the power of god will make us whatever you think you don't have if god is calling you why don't you surrender your little rod in the hands of god and say god here am i send me but the unbelief the fear the timidity and the complaint of moses still continued and that brought god's anger to be kindled against him yet it's wonderful to know about this god god tempered his wrath with his mercy 
what was the punishment given to Moses? I'm sure you may not look at this as punishment, but let's look at it. In Exodus chapter 4, verse 14, And the anger of the Lord was kindled against Moses. When the anger of the Lord was kindled against Moses, did it, did it smite him? No. Did it punish him in a very definite physical manner, like bringing a disease upon him? No. What then did he do? Look at it again, verse 14. And the anger of the Lord was kindled against Moses. And he said, It's not Aaron, the Levite, thy brother. I know that he can speak well. And also, behold, he cometh forth to meet thee. And when he seeth thee, he will be glad in his heart. And thou shalt speak unto him, and put the words in his mouth. And I will be with thy mouth. It's still with the mouth of Moses. God promised he will be with the mouth of Moses. And be with the mouth of Aaron as well. And be with his mouth. And will teach you, teach you Moses, what she, what both of you will do. And he shall be thy spokesman unto the people. And he shall be, even he shall be unto thee, instead of a mouth. And thou shalt be to him, instead of God. I'll still be communing with you. But the only thing is that you're telling what I tell you. And then he will tell the people what you have told him. That is God tempering wrath with mercy. That is God, even though he was unhappy with what Moses had said, rejecting the call of God just because he couldn't speak, yet he showed him grace, love, and mercy. The only punishment then given to Moses was the sharing of leadership with his brother Aaron. As you read other parts of Exodus, and as you read in the Numbers, you see that that arrangement to share the leadership with Aaron was actually God's second best. Aaron proved to be a mixture of great help and great hindrance. Well, it was because of the complaint of Moses. God said that as Moses returned to Egypt, you will find Aaron coming forth to meet him. Now, let's uh, learn another lesson from here. Let's now go to verse 14 again. The other part of verse 14. It's not Aaron the Levite, thy brother. I know that he can speak well. And also, behold, he cometh forth to meet thee. And when he seeth thee, he will be glad in his heart. Let me remind you, for 40 years, these people had not met. And there was no way of writing and sending to Aaron. In fact, Aaron did not know all that God had been speaking unto Moses up until this time. And yet God said, I am making the arrangement and bringing the two of you together. And as he was talking to Moses here, God was walking in the heart of Aaron to go into the wilderness. And they will be able to meet with Moses. Look at verse 27. And the Lord said to Aaron, you see that? And the Lord said to Aaron, Go into the wilderness to meet Moses. Think about that. Forty years they had not met. And now God arranged. He said, Moses, I'll send Aaron. He will meet you. At the same time, God went to Aaron and he said, Go and meet Moses in the wilderness. And Aaron, on the other hand, did not argue. Did not say, Is he still alive? How will he know that I'm coming to meet him in the wilderness? How am I sure of the spot we're going to meet? Aaron just obeyed. And he went and met him in the mount of God and kissed him. Remember, they are the same brothers of the same father and mother. That's the way God works. Always working at both ends of the line. Both ends of the line. This is an illustration. How God brings two people together. Whenever God is bringing two people together like that, he works at both ends of the line. Here is a man praying. I want to know the will of God in marriage. And then he's wondering, when I know the will of God, how will the sister know? The answer is very simple. He'll bring Aaron and Moses together. He'll bring the brother and the sister together. He'll walk in the hearts of both of them. That's what he did with the eunuch of Ethiopia and Philip. He brought both of them together. That's what he did with Saul and Ananias. God has shown Saul that a man came called Ananias, praying for him that he will receive his sight. At the same time, God went to Ananias, go to him, and he even told Saul the street, the house in which to find Saul. He brought both of them together. That's what God did with Cornelius and Peter. He had given the message to Cornelius to send to Peter. 
and while peter was you know waiting up on the in the in the second story building we're told that god appeared unto him and showed him what to do and the spirit bade him go saying i send those men go with them god will always walk on both sides or both ends of the line and so we should understand that whatever the complaints we have if god is calling us is able to equip us you can read the other references there on your outline on your own as the time is uh, past going by now we're going to point three obedience and return of moses to egypt obedience and the return of moses unto egypt let's see from exodus chapter 4 i'm reading to you from verse 18 and moses went and returned to jethro his father-in-law and said unto him let me go i pray thee and return unto my brethren which are in egypt and see whether they be yet alive and jethro said unto moses go in peace moses now submissive to god's plan first obtained permission from jethro to leave for egypt this act of moses was very commendable and it teaches us a wonderful lesson you know there are people that say that they have the call of god and they just leave their place of work without even tendering any letter of resignation without telling the immediate boss without telling anyone they are going anywhere do you know there are some men that say that they're going to do village evangelism they may live for two or three days they won't even tell their wife at home you do know there are some wives they say well i've got this urgent call to go and visit somebody and to go and evangelize and to go and preach the gospel they will not tell their husband at home there are apprentices they say they have felt the call of god and they wouldn't even tell a particular weekend they just packed their baggage and they have gone up to a particular place without telling the person that they are working with but moses has left a lesson for us here his act was very commendable it would have been wrong and it would have been the mark the act of ingratitude had moses gone down to egypt without first notifying jethro jethro had taken him in while he was a fugitive from egypt not only that he had given moses his daughter to wife not only that he had provided him with accommodation for these 40 years it was only right that moses should have told jethro that he was leaving for Egypt. Not only that, Moses had charge of his flock. Telling Jethro will make him to be able to render proper account to say, These are the these are the sheep or the flock that or your flock that has been with me. If you are going to leave for missionary work, you should be able to make all the things available that you have. Maybe you are a coordinator, for example, you are going on missions work now before you go i'm not going to tell us what is going on in your district are you not going to hand over properly or maybe you're an accounts clerk in your office and now you are going to a particular place you are going to serve the lord although the church may be making arrangement with you we recognize the call of god we recognize the power of god and everything that you have are you not going to tell them at your place of work and render proper account before you leave all this is very essential very important for us who are the children of god in fact this is a mark that we are the people of god we are the children of god when we do things in order we do them decently but we notice something moses did not give all the reasons for going back to egypt i read verse 18 to you all he said is that i want to go and see whether the people are still alive he said nothing about the lord's appearing to him he said nothing of the call and the commission he had received he said nothing of the positive assurance from god that he will bring his people out of egypt into canaan why did he do like this why was he so reserved was he not yet excited about the plan maybe because we find the very next verse that god had to give him further assurance look at verse 19 and the lord said unto moses in midian go return into egypt for all the men are dead which sought thy life and moses took his wife and his sons and set them upon an ass and he returned to the land of egypt and moses took the rod of god in his hand can you go on missionary journey without taking your 
analytical bible your concordance your all the things that god wants you to use without taking them with you can you go to the retreat you are going to preach at the retreat and do not take your bible that has cross reference and the bible that has explanation or your dates and notated reference bible with you or your thompson chain reference with you do you know there are some people that go to preach in the house fellowship they carry a small bible that has no cross reference they carry just a, a small thing maybe even ordinary new testament because after all what we're going to study at the house fellowship is only about the it's only in the new testament what if a question arises why don't you take the whole bible why don't you take a bible that has other references that has concordance so that whatever comes whatever eventuality you'll be able to deal with the case and so as moses was going he went with the rod of god in his hand and then he took his wife and he took his two sons and the lord said unto moses when thou goest to return into egypt see that thou do all those wonders before pharaoh which i have put in thine hand but i will harden is such that he shall not let the people go in other uh, studies will explain that all that that means is that i know that he wants to add in his heart i will permit him to do so but we'll explain more in other studies verse 22 and thou shalt say unto pharaoh thus says the lord israel is my son even my firstborn and i say unto thee let my son go that he may serve me and if thou refuse to let him go, behold, I will slay thy son, even thy firstborn. And it came to pass, by the way, in the inn, that the Lord met him and sought to kill him. Then Zipporah took a sharp stone and cut off the foreskin of her son and cast it at his feet and said, Surely a bloody husband art thou to me. So he let him go. Then she said, A bloody husband thou art because of the circumcision. Many people do not understand verses 24 to 26. But actually, those verses are very simple. The point is this, that Moses was now going in fulfillment of the call of God. But remember, this was the fulfillment of the covenant God made with Abraham. In fact, when God first began to talk to Moses about this, he said, I am now going to fulfill the covenant I made with Abraham. I remember my covenant with Abraham. But then the sign of that covenant was circumcision. And here Moses was going to fulfill that covenant. But the sign of the covenant had not been performed in his own family on one of the sons. Obviously, Moses wanted to perform that when the son was born. But the wife not being an Israelite, the wife not knowing the God of Abraham, refused that that thing will not be done. And so Moses, because of the situation he found himself, he didn't enforce his leadership, his authority, his headship upon that family. And so just let it like that as he was now going. God met him on the way. Judgment would have come because of the neglect. It was the neglect was about to bring severe judgment, but the son was quickly circumcised and the judgment was averted. That's why the woman said, A bloody husband thou hast been to me. She has been the one resisting, rejecting, revolting against the right and the sign and the token of the circumcision in the family. We learn a striking lesson here. We must not overlook this. A man may be united to a woman who is supposed to to the discipline of the children at home who is supposed to this man being the real head of the home but the man should still realize that he is still the head of the home and he must not fail in his duty this incident also teaches us that before a man can fulfill the call of god for ministry he must set his life in order he must set his house in order but thank god eventually it was done and now we go on to verse 27 and the Lord said unto Aaron, Go into the wilderness to meet Moses. And, went, and he went and met him in the mount of God and kissed him. Thank God, look at the, way they, at the place they met. They met in the mount of God. If God is bringing a brother and a sister together, if God is bringing a man and another woman together, if God is bringing two brothers together in business, you will not meet at the pop house. You will not meet in a place of sin. 
in a place of humility they met in the mount of god and they showed the family love to one another they kissed one another our brothers of the same family and moses told aaron all the words of the lord who had sent him and all the signs which he had commanded him and moses and aaron went and gathered together all the elders of the children of israel and aaron spake all the words which the lord had spoken unto moses and did the signs in the sight of the people what was the result and Mo and the people believed when they heard that the lord had visited the children of israel and that he had looked upon their affliction and then they bowed their heads and they worshiped what a great encouragement to moses he had thought they will not believe they will not believe and the very first move they made in gathering the elders together we are told that they believed and they bowed their heads and they worshiped if the lord is calling you there is nothing to fear but then how did pharaoh react and what were the things that follow after this first appearance before the elders of israel we reserve that for the next study the lord has taught us a lot today and we will need to now call upon the lord and we need to bring all these lessons before the lord remember what we have learned today supernatural signs that accompany divine call what are the things you and rise up and now you can begin to pray unto the lord have you been complaining i don't have this i don't have that i don't know this i don't know that i'm just a simple christian with only one single talent that i can discover in my life let that be the rod of god in your hand surrender it to god consecrate yourself to the lord if you have not been born again you must be born again because god will not allow sin in anyone that is going to be associated affiliated in fellowship with him therefore make sure you are born again make sure there's no sin in your life and God is able to remove that sin as he instantaneously removed the leprosy on the hand of Moses yes he can do it he can cleanse you he can wash you whiter than snow he can forgive you he can make you righteous and holy call upon the name of the Lord he will do it and he can do wonders in your life of course if you're sick like he removed that leprosy he can heal you instantaneously he can deal with the old serpent in your life the attacks of the old serpent he can deal with it instantaneously if the lord has been calling you to stand up and preach the gospel to evangelize to win souls declare the word of god in the bus at the bus stop in the taxi in your neighborhood in the houses around you don't complain don't say you have a slow speech that you cannot speak god said i'll be with your mouth that's all you need he will be with your mouth as moses arose to obey the lord arise and obey the lord remember you must put things right in your family is there something god has been calling you to do or maybe your wife has not been allowing you or maybe you are the wife and god is telling you to do something you say because of my husband because of my husband because of my husband that's why i went back to using jewelry because of my husband that's why i'm wearing the kind of dress i'm wearing because of my husband that's why i cannot attend fellowship regularly because of my husband that is why i'm leaving that mark of a child of god and i'm not fulfilling that token of the covenant be careful be careful obey the lord promptly lest judgment will even come upon you and maybe you are the husband it's because of my wife i've not uh, been able to dispose of that television it's because of my wife i've not been able to obey the lord in this area or that area be careful let god will deal with you in wrath and judgment god is calling you he wants you to come to his side and he's going to support you he's going to help you he's going to energize and empower you and he's going to help you all through life whatever assignment he has given you he will see you through make sure you pray and have the grace of god more abundant in your life before you leave the study today